started. Otherwise, we're going to hear. Well, welcome everybody. This is uh, this is new to to us as well. So, um, William uh, had 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 approached me and asked if we would um, be be willing to kind of give um, what we're calling a a virtual grand rounds. Grand rounds for people that don't know is something that we use in medicine whenever we go and visit another university. Often we give what we call grand rounds to different departments. So we're calling this kind of a virtual grand rounds. Drew's been in my lab. Uh, for the for the last uh, several years, and so I was going to have him um, talk and present, and then um, as far as questions, we'll see how it goes. Um, you're more than welcome to type in questions. I can't promise we're going to answer them, um, but um, but uh, you know we'll, we'll do our best. So um, go ahead, Drew. Why don't you get started? All right. Thanks, Chris. Um, can everyone? Or can you hear me all right, Chris? Yeah. Okay. Great. So um, my name is Andrew Finlay. I'm a physician scientist. I'm part of the junior faculty in the neurology department at WashU, and I, I work in Chris Wiles' lab. And um, my overall sort of big picture research goal is, um, you know, as a physician scientist to develop effective treatments for hereditary muscle disorders. So that brings us to the title of my talk, which is Limb Girdle Muscular Dystrophy, Bedside to Bench and Back to Bedside. Um, so we'll be discussing our work on a subtype of limb girdle muscular dystrophy, LGMD1D. All right, let me just fix one thing here real quick. All right, so outline for the talk. First, we'll go over some key basics on genetics and muscular dystrophy. We'll move on to our big picture and our goals. And then I'll talk some basics about limb girdle muscular dystrophy 1D as well as the gene that's involved, it's called DNA JV6. And I'll talk about two different treatment strategies that we've come up with. And then Chris is gonna talk about our efforts to translate these strategies into actual treatments. So first, what is LGMD1D? So sort of breaking it down, limb girdle, it refers to the, the shoulder and hip girdle muscles that are highlighted here in red. These are the muscles that are predominantly affected in limb girdle muscular dystrophy. Weakness in these muscles um, is going to cause difficulties with going upstairs, trouble standing up from a seated position like this gentleman is demonstrating here. It'll also cause trouble with raising your arms up above your head. Muscular dystrophy refers to a, a degenerative process in muscle where muscle breaks down and then it gets replaced by scar that's sort of made up of connective tissue and um, adipose or fat tissue. And so shown here on the top right, is a, a normal muscle biopsy, what muscle looks like under the microscope. And you have these nice rounded muscle fibers that are surrounded by this light pink connective tissue that separates the individual muscle fibers. And then you can see what it looks like in muscular dystrophy. These muscle fibers are a lot smaller. There's variation in the muscle fiber size. You can see that there's actually a lot more connective tissue separating the fibers. And there's fat or adipose tissue that's replacing the muscle fibers. So next question, how did I get limb girdle muscular dystrophy 1D? You inherited a mutation in a gene called DNA JV6 from one of your parents. And so <clears throat> to understand this, we're gonna go through some, some terminology. So your DNA is what people refer to as your genome. DNA contains instructions that make you, you. It's, it's made up of a sequence of repeating molecules, adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine, um, or A, G, C, and T. And this information is, is passed from generation to generation. Your genome is made up of two sets of three billion of these letters, and it's organized into two pairs of 23 chromosomes, which is shown in this picture here on the right. It's called a, this picture is called a karyotype. It's basically just a picture of all your chromosomes in paired fashion. Within these chromosomes, you have specific regions that are called genes, and genes contain information to make proteins, which are the, the building blocks of your cells and of your bodies. With, within your genome, you have two copies of 23,000 different genes. Different genes are <clears throat> expressed in different tissues. Some are turned on, some are turned off. And so when a gene is turned on, a photocopy is made and this photocopy is called RNA. It's kind of like a message copy and it contains blocks of this 
blue coding sequence and yellow non-coding sequences. And so for this gene to be expressed in red, you take out the yellow bits, and this is a process called splicing that creates your mature gene message. And this mature gene message then gets translated into proteins, which are the building blocks of your cells, tissue, and your entire body. And so every time a cell divides, all that DNA has to be replicated. And replication's pretty good, but it's, it's error prone and it can result in variation within the genome. And these variants are responsible for different things like your hair color, um, different height, metabolism. But if you have a mutation, or sort of a, a spelling error in important genes, this can lead to problems in proteins that are, and this is sort of the, the basis for inherited disease. In normal, perfect human DNA, you're gonna have one to two lethal mutations. Um, but remember, you have, you have two copies of each gene, and so it's often the case that that second copy of a gene is normal, and you're just, you're just fine. And this is the case for autosomal recessive disorders, where it takes two bad copies of a gene in order to cause disease. There's another pattern of inheritance called autosomal dominant, um, and in these types of disorders, it only takes one bad copy of a gene in order to cause disease. And that bad copy is essentially dominant to the good copy. And this is the case for LGMD1D. And it's the reason that it gets passed down from generation to generation. And as an affected parent, um, you're going to have a 50% chance of passing that bad gene on to your children. And so, again, the, the gene that's affected in LGMD1D is called DNAJB6 and it encodes a protein called DNAJB6. And I know this is a little confusing because there's letters DNA in it, but when I'm saying DNAJB6, I'm, I'm referring to the gene or the protein. So there are actually lots of different kinds of limb girdle muscular dystrophy. They're all caused by <clears throat> mutations in different genes. Some are inherited in a dominant pattern, others in a recessive pattern, and all the people here in this picture have limb girdle due to problems with different, different genes. Before we were able to um, genetically characterize these disorders, we would sort of separate them based on their clinical symptoms. Um, so how, uh, when the disease started, how severe it was, um, what the pattern of weakness was, if it was all proximal, closer to the torso, or if it caused weakness that was farther away um, in the calf muscles, if the heart and lung were involved, if people developed contractures and or sort of stiffening of their joints in certain parts. So these are all the sorts of things that we, uh, we still do pay lots of attention to, but that's how we used to differentiate these disorders before genetic testing. There are actually over 35 different genes that are associated with limb girdle muscular dystrophy. And these disorders can be inherited in a dominant or a recessive pattern, as I mentioned before. Dominant limb girdles um, are sort of type 1, LGMD1, whereas recessives are LGMD2. And then this is followed by a letter to denote the genetic subtype. You can see that for the recessive disorders, they got all the way up to LGMD2X. So they're running out of letters. And recently, they had to propose new nomenclature to, to adapt to this. And so that new nomenclature has um, sort of renamed LGMD1D as LGMD D1 DNA JB6 related. So it's a bit of a mouthful. How is LGMD1 D diagnosed? So the, the only definitive way to diagnose it's through genetic testing. Um, and you have to identify a specific mutation in the DNA JB6 gene. Um, there are other ancillary tests that can be performed. So muscle biopsy, blood testing for CK, um, electromyography and muscle MRI, are, they're helpful to identify and diagnose muscular dystrophy in general. But they don't provide uh, evidence for, or definitive evidence for a genetic subtype. And then one other thing to mention here is that you know, if there's a family history of limb girdle muscular dystrophy, it's really extremely important to tell your physician. This is going to help guide them in the correct direction. And it's going to help reduce sort of the diagnostic odyssey that a lot of patients go through including all of these ancillary tests. And sometimes patients even end up going through unrelated workups for unrelated orthopedic disorders. Should my family be tested for LGMD1D? I would say absolutely yes, if there's a family history of LGMD1D. 
and um, if that family member has symptoms of weakness. Um, if that family member though does not have weakness, it's a, it's a more complex discussion and needs to be discussed further with your doctor. What doctor should I go to if I have LGM D1D? So a neuromuscle specialist like Chris or I can appropriately manage a patient with LGM D1D. Um, muscular dystrophy association clinics have services that can be helpful to patients. And then in general, consultation with a neuromuscle physician is going to happen about one time per year. And then they coordinate with your primary care doctors. Why should I go to a neuromuscle doctor? You know, there's, there's no treatment. What can you actually do? And so um, my job as a neuromuscle physician is to, one, confirm your diagnosis, um, to provide genetic counseling. Another big part of what we do is to look for disorders other than limb girdle muscular dystrophy. Um, as you know, primary physicians and, and non-specialists are going to have a tendency to blame a lot of your unrelated symptoms on limb girdle muscular dystrophy just because they're not familiar with what's going on. We, um, we monitor and treat vital functions like um, heart, lung, and swallowing functions. And I think one of the biggest things that we, we do is to try and improve quality of life. And so this is done by helping patients to anticipate challenges in the future, with a, a real, real goal of just promoting independence. Um, Education is a big part of what we do. And this is with regards to you know, genetic counseling, prognosis, what to expect, um, and also the latest research. And lastly, I think it's important to see a neuromuscle specialist to actually educate your physician. So you know, selfishly, this is kind of helpful for me. Um, I think it's important for me to see patients with, with rare diseases. So now moving on to our big picture, our overall goal, as I mentioned before, is to develop therapeutic strategies for hereditary muscle disorders and to facilitate translation of these strategies into actual treatments. And so this is a long process and it starts with, um, uh, all starts with clinical care of patients and carefully describing the details of the disease and what makes it unique compared to other diseases. This is then going to facilitate or permit gene discovery in these well-defined patient groups. And then once the gene is known, you can develop model systems like mouse models to make insights into the disease mechanism, why, why the disease is happening and um, through what mechanism. And then from the, the pathogenesis, we can develop and test different therapeutic strategies. And then finally, the last step is to go back to the bedside by translating the strategy into an actual therapy. And so this last goal of translation is, is really many steps combined into one, and it's a huge step where most therapeutic strategies fail and they're, they're not able to move from mouse into humans. And Chris is going to expand more on the, the different requirements and components of how to translate a therapeutic strategy into an actual therapy. So to help illustrate the, the timeline for this process, we can look at a, a related disorder called Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So yeah, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, the, the gene was discovered in 1987. And they have a mouse model that's called the MDX mouse model. It was discovered in 1978, but then genetically characterized in 1988. And then um, they've been doing studies about how the disease happens, the mechanism since 1989. And the idea of exon skipping as a, a therapeutic strategy came about in 1999, but it wasn't until 2016 that the FDA approved Exondis, which is an exon skipping therapy. And so you can see that this whole process for Duchenne muscular dystrophy was, was largely performed in series, one after another. And so our work thus far on LGMD1D is really focused on all of these key steps to try and move them forward in more of a parallel fashion. So starting with the first key steps, clinical care, and then carefully describing um, patient groups, in our WashU Neuromuscle Clinic, we follow many patients with different forms of limb girdle muscular dystrophy. And there were actually two unrelated families who had dominantly inherited limb girdle muscular dystrophies and these are their family pedigrees. And people who were affected are um, colored here in black. And you can see uh, the disease tracking through generation to generation. And these patients had you know, a limb girdle pattern of weakness. They had proximal muscle weakness that started in early adulthood, 
or later adulthood, and it progressed to cause loss of ambulation requiring a wheelchair, you know, anywhere from age 40 to up to, you know, age 70 or even later. And when we look at muscle from these patients, we see, um, kind of like I showed before, we see variation in muscle fiber size. So big fibers, little small fibers. We also see these things called rim vacuoles, this purplish discoloration at the edge of a muscle fiber. And then using a different stain, we see this sort of reddish discoloration. So these are called rim vacuoles. And when we really zoom far into the muscle using electron microscopy, normal muscle should have this nice repeated um, sort of striated pattern. But uh, patient muscle has these myofibular lesions, so this disorganized sort of disarray of muscle fibrils. When we do MRI on LGMD1D patient muscle, we actually have somewhat of a typical pattern that we can see. So normal muscle has this um, dark gray appearance. This is the right leg, left leg. Um, this is the sort of thigh muscle, and this is the lower leg. And so this is your quad, this is sort of the front and the back of your leg. So quadriceps muscle, hamstring muscle, and then this is your shin bone, and then your calf muscles back here. And so you can see that over time, there's increasing replacement of the normal um, dark muscle color by this white color here, which represents sort of the fibrous fatty tissue that we saw in biopsies. You can also note that there's sort of a, a predilection for involvement of the posterior, or sort of the back part of the leg. So your hamstring muscles and also the calf muscles tend to be affected earlier on compared to the other muscles in the front of your legs. Um, so these two, two groups of uh, two families underwent genetic testing with something called exome sequencing, and that's how the gene DNAJV6 was identified. And since DNAJV6 was identified, you know, many more case series have been published. And in fact, um, limb girdle muscular dystrophy type 1D is now thought to be the, the sixth most common of all limb girdles, and actually the most common dominantly inherited limb girdle muscular dystrophy. So we've mentioned DNAJV6 a bunch of times, but, but what is it? So DNAJV6 is a, a pro, or DNAJV6 protein is expressed and present in all of your cells, all of your tissues throughout your body. It's a type of protein that we call a co-chaperone, and it, it helps with something called protein quality control, which is kind of like, uh, you can imagine a protein manufacturing factory combined with a recycling and waste disposal center all in one. And so what DNAJV6 does is it works with another chaperone that's called HSP70 to make sure other proteins in your body are properly folded. They can help with uh, fixing misfolded proteins. And they can even direct broken proteins to the cell's recycling and waste disposal system. And so shown on top here is another one of those electron micrographs of what skeletal muscle looks like. This is the contractile apparatus of muscle. It's called the sarcomere. And DNAJV6 and HSP70 both sit at where these arrows are pointing, so these dark bands here, which is called the Z-disc. And to sort of help illustrate, this is a cartoon of the skeletal muscle sarcomere. Red is a protein called myosin. Blue is a protein called actin. The Z-disc are these, um, the green lines here. And then these little yellow circles are to represent a Z-disc client protein of DNAJV6 and HSP70. So some sort of protein that's sitting there at the Z-disc that DNAJV6 and HSP70 help to fold or repair within skeletal muscle. And this video here at the bottom is just to illustrate the significant amount of tension that gets put on the Z-disc when muscle contracts or stretches. So um, when a Z-disc client protein is unfolded or misfolded, what we think happens is that DNAJV6 go and binds to it. It recruits HSP70, which then uses energy to fold that client back into its normal state. And then they both release. And so they go through these repeated rounds of binding and release. So to investigate DNAJV6 and HSP70's role in muscle in the disease pathogenesis, uh, we developed a strategy for 
imaging DNA JB6 in skeletal muscle of live mice using this large microscope. It's called a two photon microscope, kind of takes up a whole room. And this microscope's hooked up to an anesthesia cart that allows us to take pictures of the mouse muscle while it's sleeping. Um, and so in this experiment, we take DNA JB6, um, we take the uh, DNA that's coding for DNA JB6, but we modify it so that it's attached to this green fluorescent protein, it's called GFP, and we inject that gene into the skeletal muscle of mice. And then several days later, we look at the mouse skeletal muscle using the microscope. And so this is what it looks like. This is a movie of DNA JB6 with that green sort of GFP tag in skeletal muscle of a live mouse. And so this is what's happening here is that it's imaging multiple layers or slices of the muscle. And those slices have been assembled into this little movie. So we're moving through 3D space within muscle. You can also see that DNA JB6 forms all these little lines um, here within the muscle fibers. And those are the, the Z disks that we've been talking about. And the Z disk is a, a stabilizing structural part of muscle. So one way to investigate DNA JB6 and HSP70's movement or mobility within muscle um, and how they interact with proteins at the Z-disc is to use this um, test called fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching or FRAP for short. And so in this assay, what we do is we use uh, the microscope laser to bleach part of that green fluorescence. And then we take repeated pictures over time to see how fast that fluorescence recovers at that original bleached region. And how fast that fluorescence recovers depends on how much of that protein is in an unbound or freely mobile state versus a, a bound and immobile state. And so you know, an, an analogy would be um, for a, a fast or highly mobile protein, imagine sort of a night sky that's filled with a bunch of lightning bugs, and then you take a picture of all of them glowing, and then all of a sudden you turn on a leaf blower and it's aimed at one spot and just for a second, and then you immediately take this other photo right after using the, the, the leaf blower. And then you take repeated pictures over time, looking at the lightning bugs as they move back in and out of that space. And so you look at basically how fast those little lightning bugs are moving around tells you how mobile your protein is. So that's what we do here. We're, this is um, looking at wild type DNA JB6, normal DNA JB6 in skeletal muscle. And this is a little video I'm gonna play. Um, so it happened really quick. So after bleaching, wild type DNA JB6 comes back almost immediately. So that tells us that um, DNA JB6 normally is existing in a, a highly mobile or unbound state. Whereas DNA JB6 with a disease mutation in it, you'll see, recovers much more slowly. And so that tells us that disease mutations cause it to shift into a immobile or bound fraction. It's not moving around nearly as much within skeletal muscle. This is another way of looking at it just with still pictures. So normally DNA JB6 recovers extremely quickly and then two different disease mutations both recover much more slowly. So we next wondered if HSP70's movement within skeletal muscle could be altered by DNA JB6 mutations. So normally, if we take HSP70 with that green tag and we put it into a, a normal mouse and do that same experiment, you see that HSP70 recovers very, very quickly, just within seconds. But if we take HSP70 and put that into a mouse with a DNA JB6 mutation, its recovery is significantly slowed. And so what this tells us is that DNA JB6 mutations not only slow itself, slow its own movement within muscle down, but it also slows HSP70's movement down. Uh, and so to help illustrate what we think is happening here, we'll go over the normal situation again. So normally, wild type DNA JB6 will go and bind to an unfolded or misfolded client protein. HSP70 gets recruited and then it uses energy to fold that client back into the normal state. And then they both release back into the unbound or mobile fraction. But in the setting of mutant DNA JB6, it's still gonna go and bind to that client protein. HSP70 gets recruited, 
and then it uses energy to fold it back. But then what happens is they get stuck on that client protein there at the Z disk. And so in theory, this may result in an accumulation of unfolded or misfolded muscle proteins from reduced availability of HSP70 because it's trapped there. So what we decided to do next was to use a, a small molecule inhibitor of DNA JB6 HSP70 interaction. This drug's called YM01. We wanted to see if this could rescue HSP70 movement in the setting of mutant DNA JB6. So what this would in theory do is free up HSP70 to help reduce misfolding of these other sarcomeric proteins. So that's what we did. Um, so here is HSP70 in green here, and we've introduced it into a LGMD1D mouse. And you can see that the HSP70 recovers very slowly after the bleaching event. But in a mouse uh, that was treated with this compound via intramuscular injection, you see that it actually normalizes its recovery at the Z disk. You have to watch it pretty closely. So bleach and it comes right back. So this was promising, promising, and we wanted to test to see if this, this strategy of disrupting DNA JB6 HSP70 interaction could actually result in functional improvements in our LGMD1D mice. And so these, these mice are weak compared to normal mice, even by two months of age. And the way that we test this is this wire screen holding test. We have mice hold onto a grid, we turn it upside down, and we see how long they can hold on to that grid for. And then the LGMD1D and mice don't hold on for very long because of their weak muscles. And then these mice also have um, muscle fiber pathology. They have lots of small little muscle fibers here. And when we do a stain for NADH, NADH sort of highlights the nice normal internal architecture of muscle fibers. And in the LGMD, LGMD1D muscle, you can see that that architecture is disrupted. So we used a similar version of that drug called YM01. This new drug was called JG231. And this drug is basically better at sort of distributing throughout the whole body. And so when we gave mice this drug for a month, um, we saw an improvement in their muscle fiber size. When we measured how long they could hold on to the grid, we saw an improvement in how long they could hold on. And we also saw an overall improvement in their muscle mass. Also looking at their muscle under the, the microscope, um, with that stain for NADH, um, you can see in mice that were not treated with any drug, there was abnormal internal architecture, but after treating with the compound, you see a nice normalization of the internal architecture of the muscle. So overall, these findings suggest that DNA JB6 plays a role in, in muscle protein quality control. And this is based on the accumulation of sarcomeric proteins and myofibular abnormalities that we see with lgmd and mutations. And that targeting DNA JB6's role in protein homeostasis could be a viable treatment strategy for patients. That being said, DNA JB6 has a lot of other known functions outside of protein homeostasis and protein quality control. And you know, as a chaperone, DNA JB6 stabilizes lots of different kinds of proteins and it's known to impact cell growth, cell division, and it's actually been found to function as a, a tumor suppressor by suppressing uncontrolled growth and division of cells. So to investigate DNA JB6's other potential roles in skeletal muscle, we generated DNA JB6 knockout muscle cells using a gene editing strategy called CRISPR-Cas9. And I wanna remind you that DNA JB6 is not absent in LGMD1D patients. Patients have a, a point mutation. The protein is, is still there, but we created these cells that are lacking DNA JB6 just to understand what is it doing in muscle. Um, so it's not to model the disease, but just really understand its simple function within muscle. And when we grow these cells in a Petri dish, they form these sort of precursors to muscle cells, these elongated structures. And you can see that the DNA JB6 knockout cells have this irregular staining for a, a contractile protein called myosin, whereas the normal cells have this nice uniform staining. And when we do electron microscopy, zooming way, way in, you can see that there's significant disarray in the um, muscle fibrils within these myotubes. 
Another thing that we noticed when growing these cells in the Petri dish was that the DNA JB6 knockout cells actually formed muscle much more quickly and it formed much larger muscle cells compared to the wild type ones. So these are at the same magnification. You can see that they're a lot bigger compared to the wild type or normal ones. And so to fully appreciate the, the difference in size, here are the normal wild type myotubes or muscle cells that have been grown in a petri dish for about six days. And then here are the DNA JB6 knockout cells um, at the same magnification, so significantly enlarged compared to the wild type ones. So what this you know, suggested was that maybe DNA JB6 is playing a role in modulating muscle growth pathways. And so to remind you, DNA JB6 is known to act as a tumor suppressor and it does this by regulating several different growth pathways. And in fact, DNA JB6 is known to chaperone the activation of an enzyme. This enzyme is called GSK3 beta. This enzyme plays a key role not only in cancer and malignancy, but also plays a key role in muscle growth and skeletal muscle regeneration. And so what we next wanted to do was to evaluate DNA JB6's impact on muscle growth and muscle formation through GSK3 beta. This is sort of a summary slide of what we found. So in the normal situation, again, DNA JB6 activates GSK3 beta which exerts sort of a limit on muscle cell growth and size. And then in our DNA JB6 knockout cells, we found that there's actually impaired activation of GSK3 beta, and that removes the limit on muscle cell growth and size, and we get these big muscle cells. Then for LGMD1D mutations, exactly, we found like the opposite of what was happening in the knockout cells where GSK3 beta activation was significantly enhanced and this severely limited muscle growth and size. And so this is where we came up with the idea for using a drug to inhibit the overactive GSK3 beta in our lgmd one d mice. And this drug, lithium chloride, it's a GSK3 beta inhibitor and it's used in the treatment of different psychiatric disorders and it would, in theory, reduce the GSK3 beta induced limits on muscle cell growth and size and potentially improve strength. So that's what we did. We treated the lgmd one d mice with lithium chloride for a month, and we measured their strength by how long they could hold on to this wire grid. We also measured their strength um, based on their grip strength, how tight they could hold on to this little bar. And the mice that were treated with lithium are shown by these black bars here. What you want to do is compare it to the green bars. And you can see that over the course of a month, the mice that are treated with lithium have increasing strength. They can hold on to the wire for longer. They can hold on to the bar even tighter. Lithium also improved muscle mass. So this is um, sort of a shin muscle from the LGM and UD mouse. And then after treatment with lithium for a month, there is an increase in size. If you look at the muscle under a microscope, there's a reduction in the, in the number of these small muscle fibers here that are outlined in green. And so, you know, overall, these findings suggest that DNA JB6's role in skeletal muscle not only involves um, you know, protein quality control, but also modulation of muscle growth signaling pathways. And I think that both of these functions are contributing to the pathogenesis in lgmd one d and that treatment strategies addressing either of these functions appear to have you know, some efficacy, but the ideal treatment is gonna address both of these areas. So um, to conclude, here are some of my future goals. So I wanna I want better understand you know, how does DNA JB6 integrate these two functions of muscle protein homeostasis with muscle growth signaling. Um, I also want to figure out, you know, what is DNA JB6 interacting with at the Z-disc? What's its client protein at the, at the Z-disc and skeletal muscle? And which of those client proteins are altered by drug treatment? And then the two strategies I, I, I talked about, they act at the protein level, but we're also working on other treatments that act at the DNA or RNA level. This includes gene editing strategies using some new biotechnology. It's called CRISPR-Cas9. We're also using strategies at the RNA level that um, use antisense oligonucleotides. And then lastly, our goal is to translate these findings into actual 
therapy for patients. And this last goal you know, involves many, many other studies and hurdles. And so at this point, I'm gonna to transition to Chris, who's gonna talk about our efforts in this area. Great, thanks, Drew. Um, and we'll have some, hopefully some time for questions um, after. I have to share my screen. Give me just a second. Why is it? Okay, let me see if I can do this. See your grant. How about now? I see, yep, I see the presentation. Okay, good. You guys got to see science and work right there, me writing a grant. Um, so thanks, Drew. Thanks for, for presenting that. Drew's been uh, phenomenal to, to have in the lab. And um, this is really how science works, where um, senior faculty mentor junior faculty. So it's been great to have, have Drew around. Um, I, I want to kind of pick up where Drew left off, which is really, um, this is kind of the, the path. So I kind of call this the maze to therapeutics, where we kind of move from clinical care to patient understanding with a phenotyping, genetic discovery through the pathogenic mechanism, and of course, ultimately therapeutics. But, but this is really a huge hurdle right here. And this can often take several years, if not just years, but decades. And so um, we identified some pathogenic mechanism, we identified some pathogenic targets, and of course the next step is to get to therapeutics. But, but um, it became clear in our research lab and in my research group that, that this was really um, somewhat limiting to just think of this path right here and to really think about another parallel path of discovery that really needed to be going on which was how do I identify patients that have different limb girdle muscular dystrophies or even DNA JV6, how to find those patients and, and, and um, coalesce them into a group so that, so that if, if trials happen, we could actually um, have, have uh, registries of them, understand their natural history, and finally, other, other aspects as well. And so, um, you know, I, I want everyone to think about the physician scientist is really a continuum of somebody that does stuff in the lab, stuff like what Drew was just talking about, but also um, the, the clinical aspect of what we need to start to begin to understand. And there are significant challenges for limb girdle muscular dystrophy, not just for LGMD um, D1, but, but also for many limb girdles. And that is that they're phenotypically homogenous. So what does that mean? That means that many of the limb girdle muscular dystrophies look very similar. And why is that a challenge? That's a challenge because I can't tell who has limb girdle muscular dystrophy. I can't tell what genetic subtype they have just by looking at them. I have to do other tests like genetic testing. They're genetically heterogeneous, which means that, that there's greater than 35 different genetic subtypes. And so each limb girdle can have its own genetic cause. And so that, that uh, is a significant challenge because it's not one disease, it's maybe 35 different diseases. They're rare with an unknown prevalence. They have a very poorly defined natural history. And what does that mean? It means that a patient may know how they progress. They may know that they got weak at a certain age and that they weren't able to go upstairs at another age. But really the question is, what does that look like for a cohort of patients? What does that look like whenever I take 50 patients together? And so that's what natural history is. And then of course, there's no current therapies for limb girdles right now. And so we created uh, a, a network. And so I'm gonna explain what this network is. We called it GRASP LGMD, Genetic Resolution and Assessment Solving Phenotypes in Limb Girdle Muscular Dystrophy. And this is the consortium that we um, created. GRASP LGMD is a, is a multi-level partnership. It has uh, six academic institutions and, and we're, we're um, growing more. 
Um, it has industry partnerships, so drug companies such as Sarepta, ML Bio, MyoNexus, patient advocacy groups, so the MDA, the Jane Foundation, Cure Calpain, um, even um, LGM D1D Foundation that that, uh, that William Lowry uh, began is a is a, a participant in Grasp LGMD and helping us kind of get this network together. I put this kind of NIH FDA here. We don't have any NIH FDA funding at this point. This is my aspirational part of, of the talk is to really, that's what we think that we need. But let me explain what, what we think, why it's important. And the reason it's important is because um, I, I love this kind of schematic here where we have trial preparedness, meaning are we ready? If I had a drug today, do I even have the steps in place to even start and enact that drug? Do I even have a collection of patients? Do I know their natural history? Do I know what I would assess? Do I know the right biomarker? And, and we're really at a unique time where trial preparedness is really lagging behind possible therapies, and especially with the advent of, of novel therapy, therapies such as um, gene modifying therapies. And so really the pace of therapeutic development has begun to outpace our efforts to prepare for these imminent clinical trials. And so as therapies are developing, there becomes an urgent need to diagnose every patient with an inherited muscle disease. And so we feel that there's several gaps, and I'm going to outline three gaps in our knowledge that we think need to be addressed. One is how we diagnose people with limb girdle muscular dystrophy. Another is the tools that we use to measure a response to therapy. What would those be? And another gap is in our understanding of what it's like to live with limb girdle muscular dystrophy and so the patient experience. And so one question is how do you measure a response to a therapeutic intervention? And so this is where we talk about something called clinical outcome assessments. And what this requires is actually seeing patients in clinic in a regimented fashion using physical therapists who then put patients through several timed functional tests as well as other um, uh, uh, measures of strength, such as their hip extension, shoulder abduction, have them fill out uh, questionnaires or certified questionnaires called Active Limb or, or another one's called Promise, um, understand their breathing. And to do this in, in a systematic way where we do this at time point zero, and then do this maybe six months, a year, maybe even two years later so that we can understand what we call the natural history, not of an individual patient, but the natural history of a group of patients. And it may be different that we need to understand the natural history of a patient who can walk uh, quickly, less than 12 seconds, versus a patient who might not be ambulatory, and in which case we'd want to understand maybe upper extremity functions such as grip and pinch and how quickly they can fill a nine-hole peg test. So these are called clinical outcome assessments, and they're essential because whenever you create a clinical trial, you're creating a clinical trial not just to see if a patient gets better, but you're creating a clinical trial to actually improve one of these clinical outcome assessments. And you really only get one shot at it. You've got to choose the clinical outcome assessment that you think that's going to be modified by the drug that you choose. And if we don't know how they even change in a patient, then, uh, the, and, and I, and I, and I, I want to highlight again, I'm not talking about an individual patient. I often have patients say to me, well, I know how it looks in me. I'm not talking about an individual patient. I need to understand how it looks like in a cohort of patients. Another thing that's important is something called patient reported outcome measures. This is actually out of, I want to put this one here. So how do we know if a treatment matters to a patient? And that's something called a patient reported outcome measure. And what we do is we actually interview patients and we take undirected responses and we try to bin them into categories and try to understand what's important to the patient. And so why is that important? It's because the FDA has made it very clear that if I improve somebody's strength, but it doesn't matter to the patient, the patient didn't notice that it changed something in their life, then it's not a drug that they're interested in, in, in um in allowing to be approved, or, or in some cases, maybe they'll approve a drug that improves some aspect of somebody's quality of life that they report, but didn't improve something on a time functional test. So this is really something that needs to be done in parallel and needs to be done specifically for each, uh, for, for, for different limb girdle muscular dystrophies. So we're creating a patient reported outcome measure that we can then send out to patients and have them answer and try to understand how that changes over the course of, of a time period. 
And finally, patient identification. And this is an area that our lab is particularly interested in, which is trying to understand how we can identify patients. And as Dr. Finley said, really the only way to identify a patient with limb girdle muscular dystrophy 1D or any limb girdle is to actually do genetic testing. And so there are significant barriers that I'm sure many of you have experienced as patients to genetic testing. Payers, so your insurance company said, well, what's the point? Why am I ordering a test? Why, why should I pay for something for somebody that has a, a rare disease that's untreatable? I would say community knowledge. I would say that people, um, perhaps even in your own family, don't understand the importance of why you would want to get genetically tested. And finally, test interpretation. And that, that lies on the physician that's ordering it. They're not easy things to understand. They're not easy things for patients to understand. And they're not easy for uh, physicians, especially physicians um, that, that aren't neuromuscular physicians, such as myself and Dr. Finley, to really understand. So the Muscular Dystrophy Association, as well as another foundation called the Jane Foundation, actually um, put into place in 2015 free genetic testing for the 35 um, known limb girdle muscular dystrophies at the time. And they enacted that in Muscular Dystrophy Association clinics. So really, we were able, at the point of seeing a patient, to order genetic testing. Prior to that, I'd have to get insurance companies to, to okay it, and often the patient um, was, was then already at home and we couldn't get the testing done. And what you can see here is in testing 3,000 patients, they were actually able to understand the genetic landscape of limb girdle muscular dystrophy. You could see that LGMD2A was the most, most common. Um, DNAJB6, as Dr. Finley said, um, is actually the most common autosomal dominant limb girdle muscular dystrophy. And so this was actually very exciting because it told us now kind of what what to look for as far as what, what the prevalence was. But, but, it, but it actually caused another problem, which was that we only solved, meaning we only made a diagnosis in less than 25% of patients with limb girdle muscular dystrophy. And it left about 77% in kind of a no man's land where they either had negative genetic testing or they had something called a variant of unknown significance. And variants of unknown significance is just as vague of a term as it is right here. It is of unknown significance, and it really needs to be delineated by, um, by, by a consortium or by, by, uh, by clinicians. This is a real life example. This is uh, genetic testing is becoming so, so commonplace that patients can actually get it themselves or they can have their doctor order it. Um, and this is an exact uh, test result that was given to me, and I'm, I'm not kidding about this. This is from somebody that lives in my town, knew that I studied muscular dystrophy, and had gotten genetic testing done on their son. And they got genetic testing done on their son, and they were identified as having DNA JB6. This was the mutation. And she emailed me and said, my son has muscular dystrophy. You treat muscular dystrophy. And I knew this son. He doesn't have muscular dystrophy. Um, but his genetic test was very confusing to her and even confusing to um, the clinician. So the question is, whenever we start doing genetic testing, is it pathogenic or is it what I'm saying incidental? And so, of course, I was able to look at this and knowing enough about the protein, knowing enough about other patients to reassure this woman that this was not a pathogenic mutation and that her son did not have limb girdle muscular dystrophy D1. But you can see how that's a challenge for people. And so what we would love to do as our consortium is to take this 23% uh, that have been solved, and we think if we can just solve a small amount by going through and uh, getting patients' genetic test results, that we would be able to actually what we call resolve. And now look what we've done. We've taken the solved and we've doubled it just by just by solving a small fraction of these limb girdle muscular dystrophy variants. And so that's something our consortium would like to do. And we're doing this by creating a working group through something called ClinGen, which is a, a, a resource that the NIH does fund that can help take patients, clinicians, researchers, and kind of help us understand if gene variants are, are causative or if they're, if they're not. To, to do this is, is quite complicated. This is a variant resolution. So for that patient that I showed you that had a variant of unknown significance, we go through a very long process to try to understand this requires specialists to do that. 
And so that, of course, then feeds into what I'm calling our, our engine, where we have patients that we can identify that then feed into understanding their natural history and, and understanding aspects. And that's how we believe this kind of consortium would, would work. And so I wanna kind of leave us here with this, which is that there are significant hurdles to the implementation of disease modifying therapies, particularly in rare diseases, that include patient identification, understanding the natural history, understanding disease burden, clinical outcome measures, and that we believe research networks such as the one that we've developed are really important for modifying these types of therapies. This is my group. Here's Dr. Finley right here. Um, and this is part of the uh, GRASP LGMD um, members. So thank you. And, um, and I think we probably have, I haven't looked at the time, we definitely have some time for, for questions. I don't know um, if the best would be to put them into the chat and, um, and we, can, we can ask them. Um, We have one question here, uh, and I'll let Drew answer it. Um, why, why are we not using the new naming convention of LGMD D1? I'll let uh, Drew answer it. It's a good question. I guess part of it's just habit. Um, and I guess not, not everyone has completely adopted the new naming convention. So that those names were, were made up based on a bunch of experts who all got together in a room at a, at a, a conference in, um, Amsterdam, and they decided that this was the, the new naming nomenclature that they were going to use. And so I think it takes some time to um, ad adapt and ad adopt those new new names. So I think for uh, everyone here, I thought it might be easier to, to go with old names that everyone's familiar with as opposed to the new stuff. Then another question about um, what about, um, so there w within each, uh, Within DNA JB6, people can have different mutations. So they can have an F93L, they can have F89I, they can have other mutations. Can you describe uh, the challenges of, of that in thinking of therapies? In terms of different disease mutations affecting it? Yeah, so um, I guess whenever I think about it, I think about, you know, we have, we have rare diseases and now we're going to make that disease even more rare by only looking at a certain genotype. An example is exon dis, uh, which is only treating a subset of, of Duchenne patients. How do you think about that, Drew? Right. So um, the, the two different treatment strategies that we proposed here, those are sort of mutation. Um, uh, they don't depend on what specific DNA JB6 mutation you have. They are specifically, though, for patients with DNA JV6 mutation. So if you have a mutation in Desmond or VCP or something like that, these treatments wouldn't be um, applicable in that setting. Um, I did talk about some other therapies that we're starting to work on, and these are gene, gene and mutation specific, and that, that's, a, that's a challenge. Um, you know, how do you get a, a pharmaceutical company to become interested um, if you're making a rare disease even more rare? So it's a, it's a it's a challenge that we're working on. Great, we've got some great questions here. So um, one question is: uh, Do, do um, is there a difference in in gender, males versus females? And then I, I guess I'll throw out even um, how do we how do we um, control for that even in the lab? Sure. So it's a great question. Um, I think that. In most of the case series that have come out on patients with DNA JB6 mutations, they haven't clearly defined a, a difference between males and females. That being said, I think there was one case series that was making an argument that um, for some reason males maybe had an earlier onset and maybe a more rapid progression. I think that's going to be something important to tease out in these natural history studies that, that Dr. Weil is talking about how we control for that in the lab. So anytime we're doing um, a treatment trial or looking into the mechanism in our mice, um, we have to have equal numbers of male and female mice. And so we're sort of grouping them all together um, to try and get a, a good representation of what would be happening in the real world. Great. 
Um, so a couple of questions about lithium. So, um, you know, it's, it's an FDA approved drug. What's your take on, um, should people be taking it? Like what's your, and, and, and um, in addition, um, how was it administered to the mice and, and what happened whenever you treated the mice longer with lithium? Sure. All, all great questions. So I think the uh, first and foremost thing to, to say is that, you know, while these results were, you know, exciting and, and interesting, I really want to caution, you know, against jumping into using this in, in humans. Um, these are, you know, animal models and it's not an exact replicate of what's going on in human disease. So these mice, um, they, they actually are expressing a human version of DNA JB6 and they're expressing it probably about 20 fold more than what humans do. And so there's not exactly a clear, um, you know, equivalence between the mouse model and the human model. Um, more details about the the treatment trial in mice so we um, we did this via a injection so we did a it's called the intraperitoneal injection and we used a dose that would be equivalent to what you'd use in um, like bipolar disorder uh, that being said in humans you're going to typically take lithium by mouth and we wanted to get some quick results and so we did it via the injection to try and get blood levels up high um, but if we were to do this for a longer period of time we could have done it just via um, uh, oral administration. So, you know, I think all of this to say that there's, there's a lot of um, differences between you know, the, the mouse and, and human, and um, I would uh, be cautious about proceeding with using lithium in, in real life humans at this point in time. There's a lot of steps between now and now and then. Yeah, I think that's a good point. So I, I'm going to give my two cents as well. So I think, I think um, our goal right now is to identify therapeutic targets and to identify what might be a viable treatment option. Our goal is not to take a drug and to try and, um, and, and to cure a mouse so that we can then cure the human. We, we, we're not ready to do that. We would love to be able to do that. And so um, I, think, I think when we say cautious, it, it's more than cautious it's because the way I've been even thinking about it is really can I can I get a hint into why this thing is is being impaired in a certain way? And I'm using these drugs as tools to understand that. And so um, many of these drugs have have bad side effects and things of that nature. The um, the other drug that we used um, is a cancer chemotherapeutic drug. is likely not a, a safe drug to even even use in humans. Would I try it in a mouse for two months? Without question. Would I try it in a human being even for two days? No. And so um, th that's the way to, to really think about it. Um, can you comment on, um, and I'll make this question a little bit um, broader, but can you comment on how DNA JB6, um, understanding DNA JB6 may lead to understanding of other muscle diseases, in particular my fibular myopathies or, or other, other diseases? Yeah, I think um, that's a, a great question. I think that understanding, there, there are several other muscle disorders that are somewhat similar to um, you know, DNA JB6 mutations. Those are, there are other autosomal dominant muscular dystrophies that are a lot more difficult to understand and tease apart the mechanism um, compared to also more recessive disorders where it's typically a loss of function. And so I think um, that's one area where we'll gain more information is you know, how to address and treat uh, muscular dystrophies that are due to dominantly inherited mutations. Um, and then even, I guess, more narrow, there are other mutations in chaperone proteins that result in muscular dystrophies, that result in myofibular myopathies, that result in neuropathies. And so understanding chaperone dysfunction is going to help us to understand these other disorders as well. Great. Um, this question uh, is a great question. So this is, how do we as patients become part of the solution in affecting change? Um, 
And, and I think that's a great question. It's one of my favorite questions because I think that um, awareness is really important. And I think that as patients, um, the expectation that every doctor is gonna understand your disease is very limited. And I really think that it's your job to educate the doctors. Otherwise you're gonna be very frustrated. And I see this all the time. And so, um, and I know it doesn't sound right. I know you want the doctors to be able to know every detail, but, but in reality, helping educate your doctor, helping educate other patients, helping educate other family members is really, really important. When I think of patient identification, when I think of the challenges that we go through with patient identification, I think about patients who probably have an easier time of patient identification because it's within their family. And so letting your own family know the importance of getting a genetic diagnosis, the importance of participating in research is really gonna be important. So those are the things that I can think of that, that patients can do. Um, the other is to be patient. I, you know, we are trying uh, in, 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 in the system that isn't perfect to try to um, to, to affect change, just like you, all of you want, and so we're we're we're, you know, our we're limited in resources. We're limited in in our ability to to um, to, to do things as well. So the other would be to be patient. Do you have any thoughts, Drew? No, I think that 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 was it. Great. Well, those were great questions, and um, and I think we're we're at an hour. So I want to thank Dr. Laurie for um, for encouraging us to um, to get everyone together, and um, and thank you guys so much.